Um, for those who have not met me yet, a uh, pleasure to meet you all. I'm uh, Mike Lang. I'm one of the internist psychiatrists, and I have been asked to speak to you guys about delirium, which is an often under-recognized and difficult to deal with uh, topic on the general medicine ward. So I hope by the time I'm done, you're a uh, li Well, let's see what I can do about that. Well, we'll see. How about now? Is that better? Still not better, so I guess I'll just yell at you. It says that it's on. Should I just stand here? Is that any better? All right. Well, I'll, I'll speak up as loud as I can, and if you don't hear me, ask me to repeat something. I'm supposed to wear this because it's been recorded. So anyway, we're going to talk about delirium today. Um, and as I had stated earlier, I hope you'll be a little bit more comfortable with it by the time that I'm done. So our goals today, we're going to be trying to recognize it as an entity, which is sometimes hard, especially considering the multitude of ways that it can present, the vast number of possibilities in the differential diagnosis, and it is truly vast. It is essentially everything within the medicine realm can potentially cause a delirium, risk factors that may predispose, and treatment options with prognosis. So the first thing I'll provide you is a true story from about four and a half years ago when I was covering the psych end of things on call. This is a 37-year-old Caucasian male who came to our ED brought by the mother from another area for not acting right. He has diagnoses of mild mental retardation, intermittent explosive disorder, depression in OS, and generalized anxiety. So pretty much all psych, okay? He's done well and lived alone until about 2009. And then he had a subacute change in his behavior. He had more agitation, he had more confusion, and some twitching. Now, during that time, he'd been to four or five EDs, and he'd been admitted twice to two different outside hospitals. And she just finally brought him to our ED because she was frustrated. Over the course of those four or five outside hospitals, he'd gotten Haldol, Respiradol, and Seroquel, all without any significant long-term benefit. Okay? He'd also gotten aspiration pneumonia during one of those hospitalizations as a hospital complication and spent four days on 12 days on the vent for his trouble. So as he's here, he's agitated, he's responsive, he does not have any acute distress, and all he can tell you is he's bad, weak, and sad. He's got mild to moderate MR, and this is about as much of a history as you're going to get out of him. Okay? However, his mother, who knows him quite well, states that this is a significant change from his baseline. Okay? He has mild tachycardia, but however, otherwise, his head CT, his labs, and everything else, other than his mental status exam, is completely normal, okay? So psych is called for a consult, and they can't find anything grossly abnormal with him. But before he is sent to the psych unit, which is what we were going to do to work him up for acute agitation, the ED nurse checks something. And what do you think she checked? Think simple. It was normal. Well, TSH in his labs was normal. I don't remember exactly what it was in 2009, but normal. Skin exams? Skin exams, fine. Temperature's normal. Medication list, I mean, he wasn't on anything because they stopped all of it. Finger stick was normal. Any other guesses? His pulse ox, which was 83%. Okay, so then when they got the pulse ox, Sykes said, hold on a minute, and they got a spiral CT, <laughs> and he had PEs, okay, he had small ones, okay, and they had not bothered to check that at any of the other outside hospitals. So he wound up on the medicine service, and he got bridged with Lovenox Coumadin, and da 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 the end. So the reason why I point that out is to always step back and think, could something else be going on, especially if a person has been given a multitude of psych meds and none of them work, think about delirium. So what is it in a nutshell? It is a transient disorder of cognition and attention. And transient is the key word, okay? It is not a process itself. Delirium is a result of something else, okay? Your job as physicians is to figure out what that something else is, okay? It is also under-recognized, okay? I've seen it called schizophrenia. I've seen it called a normal part of aging. And I've seen it called depression, amongst other things. However, it has a huge amount of ramifications, okay? If you have a delirium admission, depending upon the paper that you read, one out of four are gonna die, okay? If it happens during the hospitalization, so if they come in admitted not delirious and they get delirious while they're here, 
up to three out of four die. Okay, so you have morbidity and mortality consequences with this diagnosis. Okay, so this is the DSM-4 diagnostic criteria for delirium. And I'm just keeping it at DSM-4 even though 5 got released because 5 has not been put into practice yet. So as of today, it's still DSM-4. So you have a disturbance of consciousness that can be focused, that can be their ability to hold attention and shifting. Notice it is shifting and inability to maintain, all right? Changes in cognition from their baseline, disorientation, language disturbance, perceptual changes. The time frame is usually going to be acute. So this is not going to be like a dementia where they've been such and such a way for six months and then they drop and then they're that same way for six more months. This is going to be a waxing and a waning. It is also, at the end of the day, a medical diagnosis. Okay? It is essentially always, always and always going to be an underlying medical or surgical, depending upon the situation, underlying etiology that explains it. Okay? How common is this? Well, it depends on what you read. Anywhere from 14 to 56 percent in elderly patients. Most experts will accept about 20 percent, so one out of five. Okay, ICU patients not quite half, and that makes perfect sense when you look at the medical severity of those type type of patients. Most all of them are going to be delirious. Surgeons deal with this a lot more than they would care to admit, especially orthopedics. Orthopedics has the worst presentation for delirium. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. 90-year-old ladies who've fallen and broken their hips, now they're on Dilaudid, now they're in pain, now they're restrained, they've gone to the OR and had general anesthesia. It just adds up to a great big mess if you think about delirium in orthopedics patients. Terminal patients almost always have it. It is the harbinger of death. They will develop it usually within five to seven days before they pass. Okay, And it is kind of an acute brain failure type of syndrome. And what I really want you to uh, understand, and I'll explain it when we get to a later slide, delirium is actually AFib of the brain. And we'll get to that in just a second. Um, so if you're thinking about intensive care unit patients, this was a plot by Dr. Thomason uh, several years back, looking at the difference in length of stay if a person has never been delirious versus if they have ever been delirious by a Kaplan-Meier plot. And what you see is around day four to five, it definitely separates out. And look at the length of separation. If they've never been delirious, you can usually get them out in a week. If they've ever been delirious, you're looking at 18 days. Okay, that is a remarkable length of time difference if you have a delirium diagnosis. So delirium means still acutely ill if you're in the ICU setting. Now how about if you're lucky enough to get them out of the ICU and you've dumped them on Gen Med? Well, the same sort of a thing, okay? Especially if you start going by day seven, if they've ever been delirious, your length of stay vastly increases. So delirious pretty much means not ready to leave the hospital. Although we've all known times where we have sent someone who might be a little off kilter to the nursing home. Simply because the bed was available, the time was right. We've all been there, done that, okay? Delirium subtypes. Not all delirium is the same. There are three big groupings, and how you approach those three big groups vastly differs. The first one I'll talk about is hyperactive, and this is the one you're gonna get called about. The nurse is gonna call you at midnight and go, this guy's off the chain, he needs restraints, he needs a hit across the head, whatever you wanna do, he just needs to get quiet, all right? So they're aggressive, they're shouting, they're paranoid, they're panicked, they have unexpected physical strength for their size. I mean, little old men can actually do damage if you get them riled up enough. Okay, this is going to be the hyperactive <coughs> patient. What typically causes hyperactive delirium? Drugs, okay? Hyperactive or excited delirium is typically an intoxicated state until you prove it otherwise, okay? And one of the classic ones you think about is cocaine, activating the dopaminergic receptor, okay? Others that will often do this will be PCP, LSD, ecstasy, or bath salts, okay? Bath sauce is very close. I don't know how much of it you're seeing in the EDs. We're typically seeing more of it over in sight than actually in general medicine, but it is definitely on the rise in this area. What happens is excess dopamine, okay? You get a huge fluttering, an inconsistent fluttering of dopamine in the brain, and dopamine leads to the hyperexcited state. You also see gene activation, most notably the CFOS gene, and the CFOS gene correlates to the level of paranoia which is why they always look at you cross-eyed when you're coming into the room, because they're notably paranoid. Another chemical that will often do this is marijuana, okay? 
What you worry about is heat shock proteins, okay? And that is why these drugs have such a big mortality risk when you see them in an excited delirium, because you will precipitate malignant hyperthermia. And it is not uncommon in a malignant hyperthermia patient to see a temperature of 108 or 109. Okay, they need massive cooling at that time. They get refractory seizures, they get acute renal failure, and that is how they pass, okay? A lot of our bath salts patients are actually coming here for the renal service because their kidneys are completely knocked out. We have a couple of 21-year-olds in this area now on dialysis because of bath salts, okay? So hyperthermia is always your big issue with these folks. You need to know what their temps are. Now what's hypoactive delirium? This is actually the most common, but it will be the one you're least likely to get called about, okay? The classic presentation here is you're coming in to see them in the morning and the nurse goes, he's not too much trouble, but he's not acting right. And you go, oh, okay, and then you start going in and see him, okay? Quiet confusion, inattention, very slow movements. They're just kind of blah. They're kind of there, but not quite there. They're not really engaged with you. You're telling them what's going on, but you really don't think they're getting it. That is probably a hyperactive delirium, okay? It is often confused with depression. Probably two out of four psych consults for depression are actually a delirium, okay? Cognition can also be slowed in depression. It is not uncommon. And attention can also be decreased. However, they stay that way, okay? The cardinal difference between a delirium and a depression is in the afternoons, they might be a little bit sharper. They can get with it, they can answer your questions, they're doing all right, by the evening times, now they're dull, okay? Then through the night, they're sleeping or they're having some troubles. And first thing in the morning, they might be sharp again. So if you're seeing alternation between the time of the day and the nurse sees it a little bit different than you're seeing it, think about a hypoactive delirium. This is missed a lot. Depending upon the paper you read, anywhere from a third to two thirds, we miss. And what's the last type? It's mixed. Now here's the classic presentation. This patient is up all night. They're pulling at their lines, they're talking, they're jabbering, and they just don't sleep. And the nurse calls you and goes, we gotta put this guy to sleep. He's not exactly pulling at anything, however, he is bothering her. And then you give him something to sleep, or the night float team does, and then the following morning, he's zonked, and you can't get anything out of him. And then the cycle repeats over and over and over again, okay? This can be very difficult to manage because you wind up chasing your tail, all right? So now let me get to the pathophysiology. You remember I told you that, it, yes ma'am? Okay, if you're going to differentiate hyperactive from depression, it's going to be primarily the consistency. A depressed person will have slowed concentration, they will have slowed responses, however, it will be all the time. There will be no variation throughout the course of the day. The entire seven day hospitalization, they're going to look pretty much the same. Also, the depressed patient that looks delirious is going to be irritable. So when you try to get them to do things, they're going to tell you, leave me alone. Whereas the delirious patient will give it a try and in the morning, they'll get it right. And then in the afternoon, they won't, okay? So there are a lot of neurotransmitters that are implicated in delirium. The two biggest are acetylcholine and dopamine. However, serotonin, histamine, uh, and a variety of others have also been implicated. And the key is the level of neurotransmitter flow. You know, some of you have depressed neurotransmitter right now. I can see some eyes getting heavy, and I get that. It is late in the afternoon. Some of you might have a little bit more alert neurotransmitter flow, but it's still fairly consistent. It's going at a consistent level from one brain region to another, and that is how your brain works, okay? If you elevate neurotransmitters, then you'll get disease states. If you deplete neurotransmitters, you will also get an entirely different disease state. For example, persistently elevated dopamine in the brain is schizophrenia, okay? Persistently depleted dopamine in the brain is Parkinson's disease. Intermittently flowing dopamine in the brain is delirium. Take serotonin, for example. Persistently elevated is serotonin syndrome, okay? Or psychosis. Persistently depleted is major depressive disorder. Intermittent serotonin flow is delirium, okay? So any systemic insult that interrupts the level of flow at any given time, such that it's good at some moments, not good at others, kind of tipping the balance, leads to an intermittent pulsatile flow of that neurotransmitter. That is delirium. So if you think about it, it is a chaotic rhythm of neurotransmitter in the brain, AFib for the brain. So that's kind of the pathophysiology in a nutshell.
okay? So what are some of your presenting symptoms? Again, you're going to have clouding of consciousness, difficulty with attention, disorientation. They will often have illusions. They will see a coat in the closet and think it's a person, all right? There is a coat actually in the closet. They're just misinterpreting that stimuli, okay? Dysphagia, dysarthria, asterixis is a possibility, and again, a fluctuating level of consciousness. <coughs> What's your major risk factor? Well, dementia, first and foremost, okay? Their flow isn't going that great at baseline, so anything else you add on top of it will automatically make this worse. So, half your cases are going to have this as an underlying etiology. So, anybody from the nursing home, you better be thinking about it, especially if it's an acute change from baseline. Even if they're not demented, over the age of 65 will vastly increase their risk. The number of chronic medical illnesses is additive because, again, you've got all these systemic stresses and you add one more acute thing on top of it, it tilts their balance, okay? And any new acute medical problem. So the differential diagnosis, and I will go through this quickly, but I want to kind of give you an idea of just how many things could possibly have been attributed to a delirium. You've got metabolic cases, thyroid, hypoxia, as in my uh, first case, perfusion states, cardiac arrhythmias, systemic anemia, infectious causes, okay, structural changes in the head, brain tumors, brain abscesses, hypertensive encephalopathy, substance intoxication or withdrawal, either one can be equally likely, medications, and the list is extensive. One important point I'll make is corticosteroids. Solumedrol or Decadron can do anything psychiatrically. You can make a normal person manic, you can make a normal person depressed, you can make a normal person anxious, okay? In the presence of systemic steroids, you have an acute change in mental status. It is due to the steroid until you prove it otherwise, okay? They are ca capable of anything, and that is why when we're giving people things like interferon, which is actually a specific type of steroid, you have to rule out psychosis first because it will make it worse. The post-operative state, a change in their environment, especially if they go to the ICU, sleep deprivation, fecal impaction, severe pain, okay? Uh, physical restraints often makes it worse, and if you think about that, it makes sense. You're confused, you sit, you don't feel well, and now you're tied down to the bed, and you can't move, and you're uncomfortable. So now you add agitation on top of confusion. It will only make it worse. Use of a Foley, iatrogenic agents, and actually use of three or more medications. Name me the last time you've admitted a patient and you didn't change three drugs. You probably can, and you probably won't for the rest of your time here because you do this all the time. But again, you're upsetting their balance with all those changes. So you can precipitate confusion, okay? When you call a psych consult for an acute mental status change, what the psychiatrist does is they put on their internal medicine hat or their surgery hat, and they try to figure out something that you missed. That is what they do especially once they've identified a delirium. And I'll tell you, nothing makes a psych resident happier than to catch the urinary tract infection or the whatever that you might have missed. That is the tip of their day. Um, so, and the point that I want to make about this slide is that you have to have a high index of suspicion uh, and you have to keep in your differential diagnosis. If you have any acute severe illness, high age, critical care setting, multiple medications, especially mind-altering medications, you have to think about this. You also have to think about it in a departure from baseline. Where does this person live normally, okay? And we'll illustrate that in the last case of the lecture, but the departure from baseline is another cue to the likelihood of this being a delirium, okay? Some assessment methods. This is not all just guesswork. There are some validated methods that you can use at the bedside to figure this out. This is a nursing method called the CAM, the Confusion Assessment Method. You need all of the top three and one of the bottom two to make the diagnosis, okay? So you'll often see in nursing notes sometime, acute mental status change, suspect encephalopathy, CAM positive. That's what that means. And it's pretty easy to do. You can use it yourself because it's fairly quick. Change in mental status, uh, observation by you or the family, fluctuation over minutes to hours, and that's typically by the nursing staff, inattention, and it's pretty easy. Ask them to do the months of the year backwards, okay? Most delirious patients cannot get to June, all right? They will have a lot of trouble with that, and this is a simple way of assessing it at the bedside. Hyperalertness, alternating with drowsiness, and rambling incoherent speech. So you can use the CAM. 
The most specific is the delirium assessment, and that was done by Trespasis in 1988. All of the studies on delirium use this as a rating scale, especially when they were evaluating the drugs that you're gonna give people, okay? It has a really good sensitivity and specificity, 90%, for differentiating delirium from other things, okay? If you do the rating scale and the score is less than eight, you do not have a delirium. It is probably a dementia or depression or something along those lines. Eight to 11 is what we call subsyndromal delirium. It's still in the running. If it's greater than 11, it's realistically a delirium. So you can kind of use this to tease out delirium versus dementia. And what are the pieces of the scale? Well, here they are, and they are ranked from zero to three based on your assessment. Temporal onset, the more abrupt, you get a three, less abrupt, a zero. Sensory disturbance, the hallucination types, they tend to be tactile, gustatory, and olfactory rather than auditory. Auditory hallucinations are psychotic until proven otherwise. Visual tend to be drug withdrawal states until proven otherwise. Delusions, motor behavior, clarity of thinking, the level of physical illness, their sleep-wake cycle reversed, variability of mood, and variability of symptoms. The more shifting, the higher the score. This is, uh, this is arguably the most important piece. So you rank it zero to three with a maximum of 30, but anything above 11 is positive. Okay, and here is your delirium workup. You guide it by H and P. You don't want to necessarily do a shotgun. Not everybody needs an LP, but if you have an acute change in mental status and you can't explain it any other way, you might want to, okay? We actually found a Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease on psych by actually finally doing an LP, okay? So, delirium workup. Potentially delirious patient on the medical unit, you order an EEG to confirm your diagnosis. Which one will most likely be the delirium? Which waveform. Okay. What is that one? That's an absent seizure. Frontocentral beta activity is probably laying with your eyes closed, but still awake enough to hear your surroundings. The posterior alpha, you're getting a little drowsy. That's probably half of you right now. <laughs> Generalized slow wave activity is the EEG presentation, and right temporal spikes is a temporal lobe seizure. So if you look at it, okay, this is a 60-year-old lady with bronchopneumonia. Look how slow that is, okay? This is an absent seizure, all right? So it's generalized slow wave activity. So it pretty much nails down whether or not you've got seizures or other types of presentations versus a delirium. Neurology loves to say generalized slow wave activity, which is pretty much encephalopathy, okay? So behavioral management, this is where you start, okay? You want the best level of care for their level of uh, medical acuity, frequent reorientation. If they don't know where they are, tell them. The more they are reoriented, the better off they will be. You want to avoid overstimulation. Excess stimulation makes all delirium subtypes worse. You want the room as calm as possible. Yes, sir. If it's an excited delirium, what? Well, you would probably have a little bit more excess activity. It would probably be higher than the front of central beta. Um, but you're not going to have those spikes and waves. You'll have alternating slowing with activity because remember the frontal lobe is not really engaged in that sort of a delirium. Keep it simple. I often tell folks the same nurse, the same nursing assistant every single time. Don't give them new people because that just gives them more to worry about because they're not able to process all those faces anyway. Put as many familiar things in the room as you can. Picture of the grandson, blanket off their bed, whatever the case may be and minimize their environmental stimuli. Physical restraint as a last resort, okay? <clears throat> At pharmacological management, take away as many mind-altering drugs as you can, especially the anticholinergics. You'd be amazed at how many 75-year-old women are out there with 50 milligrams of Elevil to help them sleep at night. It'll get them just as anticholinergic and delirious as the day is long. They probably don't need 50 milligrams of Elevil anymore, okay? Any medical problems, and then you got to be very careful with your psychotropics. Haldol is not for everyone because sometimes you can paradoxically make them more agitated. Whoops. So now let's quickly go through the meds. Haldol is the first and the foremost. Why? Because it's the oldest. No other reason. Okay. It's been studied the longest. It also has the fewest anticholinergic effects. 
But really, most of the studies that uh, validate this are 20 years old, and that's because no one has seen fit to challenge how all, because it works pretty well, okay? Uh, the delirium rating scale, it shows great reductions. An important point that I want to make, you don't need to hit these people with hammers, okay? A lot of times the nurses will say, five milligrams of Haldol, please. You know, you don't need five milligrams of Haldol. If you read most of your site consults, if they're elderly and very sick, 0.25 to 0.5. Low dose is all you will require. You don't need to hammer them because then you will iatrogeni iatrogenically create a sleep-wake cycle reversal because Haldol is potently sedating. You're titrating them to calm and calm only. If they're younger, maybe two to four milligrams, but that's younger and more stable. So remember, lower doses first. Respiradol is an alternative, because I have seen people getting 10 every two and not responding to Haldol. Haldol is not for everyone, and not everyone is gonna get fixed on it. So you have to have something else in your back pocket. One advantage of Haldol is you can give it a variety of ways. There's even a Haldol suppository at this institution, if you are so inclined. Okay, so you do have a variety of ways that you can give it, but it doesn't work for everyone. Respiradol can be an alternative, and what makes Respiradol nice is it has a rapidly dissolving capsule. So you can slide it underneath their tongue and it dissolves right away, so you don't have to worry about them swallowing it. It too works, but it can also cause extrapyramidal side effects like Haldol can. Okay, Zyprexa also works. And what I would say is if you want to use Zyprexa, it's fine. It causes a wonderful calming effect, okay? And if you use it long term, you can get diabetes problems and cholesterol problems. But you're only looking at 7 to 10 days with that, so it's probably okay. Seroquel is the same. Seroquel is a marvelous anti-agitation agent. I have seen Seroquel used for vent weaning in the ICU because you can start giving them the Seroquel. It chills them out decreases the anxiety while you're taking them down off the vent. So you're able to more naturally transition them off. Geodon and Abilify can also work. Uh, I have seen Geodon for cryptococcal meningitis and it worked pretty well. Uh, you just have to worry about QT prolongation with that drug. Benzodiazepines are often used, okay, but they don't necessarily work well and they can bite you long term, okay. The only one you realistically need to use benzos for is the excited delirium. And that's why it's important to know what subtype you're dealing with. Because the other two tend to get worse on benzos, whereas the excited will get better. Okay, Dementia, again, one of the most consistent risk factors. You have your corticals, that's Alzheimer's. The subcortical, which would be an HIV dementia. Mixed is multi-infarct dementia. And pseudo-dementia is major depressive disorder. Okay. There are four secondary dementias, and I just mentioned those because occasionally they show up on the boards. Hypothyroidism, B12 deficiency, acute intermittent porphyria, and malnutrition. Okay? Just remember, any cognitive change in a demented patient, think delirium first. Okay? And just to give you a comparison, pretty much the main thing to remember is delirium is fast and fluctuating and unpredictable, whereas dementia is slow, insidious, and fairly progressive. Okay? There will be more consistency with, de with dementia than there will ever be with a delirium, especially on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, AIDS-related delirium. In end-stage AIDS is where you often see this. We don't see it as much anymore because of heart therapy, but back in the day, delirium was what you saw just before an AIDS patient died. Okay, PML and HIV-associated dementia were very common. The AIDS-related patient has a lot of apathy. They are the lay in the bed and just lie there kind of folks, and that is how they will often present, okay? When Dr. Breibart looked at this uh, a while back to try to figure out what the best drug was for HIV patients, he compared Haldol and Thorazine, a really old anti-epileptic, uh, antipsychotic, to Ativan, and he had to stop the Ativan arm early because they all got worse. They got more confused, they got more disinhibited, they got more apathetic, okay? He also found that within seven days of the onset of delirium, 50% of them died, all right? When you see delirium in an HIV patient, it's really, really bad, okay? <clears throat> delirium tremens, this is the prototype activated delirium, okay? 5.2 times more likely in men, but it gets missed in women because they don't have the autonomic symptoms as much, okay? You pretty much need heavy alcohol use for a number of years, especially over the age of 40, okay? 
that you have early symptoms, tremor, anxiety, tachycardia, and that's typically eight to nine hours. Middle is irritability, mood changes at 48 to 72, and then overt delirium at about 96 hours. That is a general rule. I have seen an, a late delirium last two weeks. I have seen a late delirium start 10 hours after the last drink. It varies, okay? But as a general rule, how it will go, okay? What happens is an imbalance between your parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. You drink and you drink and you drink. All your GABA receptors are depleted. All your glutamate receptors are activated to the ceiling. You take the alcohol away, you've got no inhibition to keep the system like it is anymore, and your tilt table flips. So now you have glutaminergic hyperexcess, and that's where you get the psychosis, that's where you get the blood pressure changes, that's where you get the seizures, okay? That is why we use benzos. Again, excited deliriums are the only place that you're going to want to use a benzodiazepine, okay? They activate the GABA receptor and put everything else back into place. <laughs> You taper them so that you can get the GABA receptors to upregulate again and restore balance. Okay? You of course use the CY protocol so that you can dose these adequately. An important point that I will make to minimize the amount of benzo that you have to give people, we will often put mood stabilizers and anti epileptics on board. It protects you against the seizures. It also helps restore that imbalance a whole lot better so you don't have to give them so much Ativan. So here is a 54-year-old white male, long history of alcoholism, cirrhosis of the liver, depression, blah, 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 presents with decompensated liver disease, and he's got alcohol withdrawal. Your best choice here is, and you know I did not put out of hand up there. Delirium, think. Does everyone agree? Now, the answer choices were picked specifically, but the answer is actually clonazepam, and here's why. He's got decompensated liver disease, so you've got liver failure, okay? So he's not going to be able to process drugs. You just heard that last lecture, think medications first. Here is a classic illustration. Someone with decompensated liver disease loses their class, their type 1 oxidation and reduction reactions in the liver, so they can't process drugs very well. Librium has a half-life of 100 hours. So if you give them Librium in decompensated liver disease, they're asleep for six days. And there they are in your service, sleeping soundly for a week. That is why you use Ativan, okay? It's not just because Ativan is that much better than anything else. Ativan can only use type two, glucuronidation reaction. So the liver can still do it. And it doesn't have any active metabolites. So it will wear off reasonably fast compared to some of the other ones. You've only got four you can use in that cirrhotic liver. Ativan, Cirax, Restoril, and Clompin. The rest of them last for days. They'll just build up and there you are with a worked out patient. So just remember that. That is why you're using Ativan. Okay, complications, malnutrition, aspiration pneumonia, pressure ulcers, all of these have been linked to delirium. And this is one of the reasons why they stay forever and ever and ever. Okay, these complications are what keep them in the hospital. It also increases their in-hospital morbidity and mortality. Prognosis, this was done uh, and published in the Journal of Critical Care Medicine for patients in the ICU. They looked at 268 all diagnosis ICU patients. The only criteria is they could not be intubated, so they could assess them adequately. So all other diagnoses non-intubated. And what they did is they followed them with twice daily CAM assessments, so the nurses did it. And then they separated them out if they were ever delirious versus never delirious. And what they found out was the higher the Apache 2 score, the most likely they'd be delirious, and 50% of them were. So it's pretty common, okay? Then they followed them out to whatever their eventual, eventual discharge was. 41% of the time, they did not leave the hospital. 25% of the time, they were more likely to die, okay? And another 35% of the time, they, had, they were more likely to end up in a nursing home rather than going back home. So you've got a one out of five increased chance of death on top of your ICU if you wind up with a delirium. So there's a huge, again, mortality risk to it. A couple of wrap-up comments, okay? Subsyndromal delirium, I would say if you're in doubt, treat it as if it was a delirium because it will likely <coughs> progress to that if you don't do something. Over-the-counter drug usage, Benadryl, for example, can get you in just as much trouble as some of the prescription meds. Family education is important because a lot of them are going to freak out and go, they're brain damaged or whatever else the case may be. 
and you need to know, they need to be educated about this so that if they see it at home, they know to bring them back to the ED because most likely something has happened to tip the balance again. A delirious patient cannot sign out AMA. A delirious patient also does not have the capacity to make any medical decisions at all, so don't ask them. Until you can be sure that their mental status is consistent, don't let them sign anything. And we'll skip that. So my last thing. This is a 56-year-old man admitted to the general medical floor for meningitis. Okay, this actually was a case that was so argued at the time it went to the president of the hospital because people were so upset about how this was going. This was a very prominent trial attorney in the Pitt County area, okay? So his functional status is pretty good, okay? He got IV antibiotics and some appropriate medical care, okay, for his meningitis. Uh, he was on the hospitalist service, not the ECU service. <laughs> During the acute phase, he had severe confusion and psychosis, and at one point, he tore the sink out of the wall, all right? Remember, unexpected physical strength. During the recovery, he would become responsive and he would answer questions appropriately at times, okay? But in the evenings, he was acting out, and that's when he tore the sink out at one night. What type of delirium is this? This is the mixed, okay. Mental status had not returned to his prior baseline. Remember, this guy's a trial attorney. He's not dumb, all right? If he can't answer questions and if he can't tell you the months of the year backwards as a trial attorney, he is far from his baseline. Uh, at times he was not sure what was happening and the medical staff was like, we're done. His LP cultures are negative, his blood cultures are negative, blah, 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 blah. Okay, where should he go? Because of course the, what they wanted was a transfer to psych, which did not happen by the way. And that is why the president of the hospital was called. Okay, the point that I'm going to make, and he didn't go to psych, he wound up going to palliative care and the psych helped out. Delirium almost always happens acutely, okay? But it is a myth that delirium starts and stops like that, okay? A lot of times it does, but many times it will linger, okay? Sometimes the recovery can take weeks. Now that doesn't mean he has to stay on a medicine service for weeks, but you at least need to recognize that delirium is there, and if you're gonna send them to the nursing home, they need to be aware of it so they can be monitoring his mental status over time, okay? They often get PTSD, and primary care follow-up is crucial. Why is that? Because if they've ever had it, their risk is increased by a factor of 2.5 and their risk of death at one year goes up by a third. Okay? People who've had delirium get delirium. Questions? No questions? Yeah. If you've, got a, yeah, if you've got a delirious patient, it also depends on the severity. If they're pulling the sink out of the wall, you gotta do something now. Okay, so you try to figure out what the, the etiology is. Some of this is multitasking. So you can use the low dose Haldol and you're going, well, is there a Foley in? Do I need to check the UTUA? So you let their presentation guide what you investigate. And then you start the Haldol. So this can all kind of be done simultaneously. But you can't send them out Haldol. Mm, you can have, probably will today actually, since I'm on service. Um, what I generally tell folks is, when the mental status has started stabilizing, let's say you fix whatever the problem is, and now you're seeing consistent, consistency through the course of the day, and they're returning to their baseline, when they return to their baseline, you can start tapering off the Haldol. You don't necessarily want to stop it too fast, just in case they might get confused again but once they're back to baseline, you start the taper. So they don't have to stay on it forever, but they do probably need to stay on it until they return to where they were. Other questions? All right, thanks for your attention. <laughs>